Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. Yes, we're going back to the future of computer technology today, right back to 1977, where it all began. One of the pioneering computers of the modern era and one of the biggest selling computers that a lot of people forget about. Everyone remembers the Apple II and computers like that, but well, this thing was actually the biggest selling computer of its day back in the late 70s. This is the uh, Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1. If you don't recognize it, it's an absolute classic. And thanks to uh, one of my viewers, Ben, for loaning me this thing um, so that we can tear it down and take a look at it. It's not a huge amount in these things, but it'll still be very interesting retro technology. I love this. And look, it's fully working. No problems whatsoever, 37 years old, and it boots up just like that. Now, way back in the mid 70s, an employee called Don French at Radio Shack actually bought one of the MITS Altair kits, one of the first do-it-yourself, uh, well, the first do-it-yourself uh, hobby computer in the world. That's what started the revolution. He thought it was fantastic, started designing his own computer, and he eventually convinced Radio Shack that they should jump on this bandwagon and produce their own computer, which they started to design it in 1976, uh, and it was released in 1977. And you've got to remember the market back in 1977, there was basically nothing out there. There were three major computers released in 1977. This TRS-80 Model 1, the Commodore PET, and the uh, Apple II were all released in 1977, and they were the big three competing it out. And this one actually won out at the time, and this was the highest selling computer of its time. It, it, it even beat the Apple II at the time. So it was incredibly successful, mainly due to its low price point. And they really screwed the bill of materials on this one. For example, it only displays uppercase characters, and supposedly uh, that took a dollar fifty off the bomb cost which took five bucks off the retail price of the computer so that's how desperate they were to get a really low price point and this machine was released at six hundred uh, dollars back at the time and that was just the computer uh, unit itself that didn't include the monitor which wasn't really a monitor it was just a regular TV that they called a monitor you could have actually uh, used anything with it really but this is one of the this is the original monitor that uh, came with it black and white and it was originally released in 1977 with 4K of RAM, expandable to 48K, uh, but 4K as standard with level one basic, although that machine didn't last long. And by the way, that machine did not have the numeric keypad. So if you've seen some uh, photos of this old Model 1 and they don't have that keypad, that's a very early unit, which didn't last very long as well. They added the numeric keypad fairly quickly after the introduction of that. So this one actually has it. This one's a 1978 uh, vintage unit serial number, a couple of thousand as we'll see soon. But uh, then they quickly up the RAM as well to 16K of RAM as standard, expandable to 48K, and then a 12K level 2 basic in ROM. That was a, um, a cut down Microsoft uh, basic from their 16K basic. It was cut down to 12K really cutting that cost down ensure the computer's success. But uh, they thought that they'd only sell a couple of thousand of these a year. It turns out they sold orders of magnitude more than that, and it was wildly successful and outsold the Apple II and the Commodore PET, which were the two major competitors. And $600 Back then, about $2,300 uh, in today's money. Woo! And of course, it had stunning specs. Uh, both the Apple II and the Commodore PET used the 6502 processor running at 1 megahertz. This used the classic Z80 processor and ran it at 1.774 megahertz. So significantly faster. I'm not sure of the actual benchmarks, but uh, raw processor speed was actually uh, faster than the Apple II and the Commodore PET. And other stunning features, full stroke QWERTY keyboard, of course, absolutely better than that Commodore PET chiclet keyboard thing. And uppercase only text, as I said, because they wanted to shave a couple of bucks off the cost, uh, 64 by 16 character display, and basically didn't have a graphics mode, although the characters could be divided up into uh, little 
uh, smaller pixels so it effectively did have a graphics resolution of 128 by 48 and that's what you're seeing here I wrote a little basic demo program and they're the actual pixels on the screen I'm turning on and off individual pixels 128 by 48 black and white only none of this color rubbish now as it turns out it didn't last all that long they replaced it in 1980 with the model 3 now there was a model 2 but that was uh, that was earlier but that was aimed at business users and priced at a different market so it effectively was replaced by the model 3 so it only had a three-year uh, lifespan if that and basically the reason for that is because it didn't meet the new FCC requirements this thing just spewed out the RF like there was no tomorrow and swamp nearby AM radios and things like that and we might actually uh, check that later on the spectrum analyzer and see what we can see from this thing hmm and this thing actually had double precision floating point basic can you believe it oh state of the art and as with all machines of the era yes you basically stored your programs on cassette tape so you could buy a separate cassette uh, tape recorder with it and eventually they released a uh, unit which sat under the monitor an expansion unit which could hold floppy drives woohoo so a lot of people remember the Apple II as being the computer that sort of pioneered the industry well you can argue that this one actually pioneered it I mean the Apple II had color and you know stuff like that but hey this thing was cheap and it outsold the Apple II back in its day by a fair margin so this was the most pioneering and popular computer of all time arguably sorry Apple II fanboys but yeah it was pretty much a heap of crap really this model one and that's what uh, earned its nickname the trash 80 so to speak in the language of the era this is the trash 80 from rat Shack. beauty so here is what you got for your 600 bucks back in the day or 2300 dollars in today's money you just got the computer itself with the power supply that was it the monitor was extra as i said the tape deck was all optional extra so <laughs> there you go 600 bucks bought you a well basically let's go with the 16k level 2 uh basic machine uh, with the z80 processor running at 1.774 megahertz with that basic in rom booted up and that's pretty much all it did now this one does have some extra labels stuck on here by the owner and uh, that wasn't part of the original uh, keyboard at all but you know it's basically a n not a bad keyboard it's a nice full stroke thing and you know separate numeric keypad which i said the very early models there there weren't there were only a couple of thousand or something at most that had the uh, that didn't have the numeric uh, keypad in it so you know it was really quite a usable machine from the keyboard perspective and it was all built into the one thing and well yeah it was built down to price and limited functionality with the uh, 64 character by 16 line display and sort of the base the effectively zero graphics no color stuff like that there was no sound in this thing by the way couldn't even generate sound although with all the RF emission you could actually um, put an AM radio nearby and, and get some squawks out of the thing or uh, hook it up to your cassette uh, tape interface and you can make the cassette uh, make sounds happen through the headphones on the cassette uh, deck or something but yeah but hey this is not a bad computer at all full stroke keypad thumbs up and here's the keyboard on the thing sorry about the flicker that's just the frame rate of the refresh rate of the screen uh, against the uh, camera frame rate here I can tweak that but uh, what's the point point? and yes this was an RCA TV and they basically uh, just retrofitted it to uh, work to be a monitor and sold it as a monitor and look this is the original cable there's no grommet in there I've been told by the owner who originally bought this thing that it didn't have a grommet this is how it came and you basically had brightness and you had contrast and power and that was basically it and uh, yeah black and white only it was a uh, later models were replaced with a uh, green screen one but this is one of the early units and I know you can't wait to see this thing boot up so here we go let's turn it on ta-da 
memory size i don't know what to type there so we just hit enter and there it is radio shack level 2 basic actually i believe that memory size one is an older version of the uh rom the newer one actually saved a few bytes by just putting mem size or uh, something like that and there it is the trash 80 microcomputer system custom manufactured in the united states of america america by Radio Shack, Fort Worth, Texas, 76102, catalog number 26-01006. This is a really low serial number one too, by the way, in the scheme of things, because they sold a couple of hundred thousand of these, and this is um, uh, sub 10,000, 9,529. So not bad, especially considering that it was sold here in Australia. In fact, it would have been one of the very first ones in this country, because the owner of this, uh, his family actually ran a, uh, well, Tandy, as it was called here, a Tandy dealer in Australia. So uh, they got one of the very first machines into the country and you can see the stuff through there we can see the large electrolytic caps in there and uh, unfortunately he's already voided the warranty on this thing gosh darn it but it's actually not a bad design at all they've molded in the little uh, angled standoffs here so the keyboard goes up at an angle plus of course you can get through to the huge uh, huge number of ventilation holes here you can see the board right through there but that allows ventilation come up through here there's no fan of course but uh, and then vents on the back of the thing here and here's the uh, expansion interface which went off to either the uh, printer adapter which I do have I'll show you that in a second uh, or the floppy uh, drive adapter or the uh, uh, floppy drive expansion interface and pretty much there wasn't much else there was the power button on here real clunk and power button on this soft power rubbish and you basically got power input uh, video and the cassette tape interface and look they all used the same uh, five pin din interface so you could accident I don't know what would happen if you accidentally plug the power connector into the video or the tape but geez that's just no good at all <laughs> <laughs> but these these DIN connectors were all the rage in these computers back in the day because they were so dirt cheap and readily available and so common to the designers of the age. So, hey, they were used in everything, as crappy as they were. And curiously, there is actually a switch hidden away in here. It's even got a key top on it. I'm not sure if that's uh, part of the original design, but if I hit it, it basically like is a, uh, is a brake key pretty much. And this is the original uh, Centronics printer interface for it. It's just got the uh, card edge connector, which plugged into the connector expansion connector on the back, and it went off to your printer. And basically, there's just a, a couple of uh, 74 series logic in there. That's about it. Well, let's crack this sucker open. I know everyone wants to see inside. Oh, big long self tapper screws there. Um, it's not going to be terribly interesting, I'm afraid. It's. Uh, going to be one big board with all uh oh, these are different size screws i better uh, keep them in the right location um yeah one big board with all dip through hole technology of course classic for the day and uh i think we may have a screw in the wrong place anyway um let's have a look at the design of it oh yeah these are lengthy screws go in the back, okay. All right. Slightly different length screws because of the angled case. And uh, we should be in like Flynn in a second. And they probably had a few changes. There were mods for this thing. You could uh, do a hardware mod to take it from level one to level two, uh, for example. So here we go. Let's... Is this going to, yeah, that's off like that. No, there's actually, yeah, one big keyboard. There's actually an expansion thing down here. Whoa, okay. There's a couple. Look, that's a key, must be a keyboard interface keyboard. I thought it was all on one uh, board, but gee, apparently not. Now, if we take out our keyboard here, it mounts on some posts, but yeah. And Japan, manufactured by ALPS in Japan. Fantastic. They were the uh, leaders of key switches back in the day. Kind of still are. 
and like I said this is a 1978 vintage one there it is copyright 1978 Tandy Corp the uh, monitor was also manufactured in 1978 and of course that would be right based on the serial number of just under 10,000 because this was released in Oct around about October 77 so yeah the 10,000th unit would have been manufactured sometime in uh, 78 and the construction is uh, exactly what we'd expect of the day in, P in terms of the PCB uh, double sided we've got uh, tin roll plated traces before it was um, uh, the solder mask was put on top so you end up with those uh, crinkly and uh, raised traces with the uh, tin coat on them I'll show you get the macro lens and show you that up close uh, the of course the uh, keyboard was manufactured in Japan the ALPS uh, keyboard so that's why the uh, PCB material everything looks different would have been done by uh, ALPS and sent as a complete uh, module to uh, Radio Shack and they would have uh, just whack that on there but uh, the PCB I don't I assume would have been manufactured in the US um, it was certainly assembled in the US and uh, and tested and there you go that's what I mean by those uh, crinkly traces there you can see that it's um, basically the trace the copper trace is all raised up because it is a tin roll coated before it's before they put the solder mask on top of that they don't do that these days of course they do uh, SMOBC or solder mask over bare copper but back in the day this was very common so it looked like it was all bubbling up and peeling off and the solder mask but it actually wasn't that was the uh, tin plate under there now believe it or not what's holding this board in like this is not this uh, screw here that's just holding a heatsink underneath is actually these things <laughs> they're I don't know they look like dried up double-sided tape but they're not they're uh, something else entirely but they're rather weird um, kind of spaces I have no idea what material that is it's absolutely bizarre but uh, oh, some of these are well and truly stuck on I certainly didn't expect to have to dig into something like this to try and get a board out that <laughs> that's for sure this one is the only one left and it's crumbling or oh, starting to draw some blood there and uh, these boards you've got to be careful you slip your the, the um, dip pins on the bottom extremely sharp you can really give yourself a nasty uh, nasty cut with a little bit more persuasion it did actually slide off so we should now be able to lift the board out ta -da! from the case and we're in like Flynn and this is actually a beautiful PCB why do I say that it looks a bit uh, yeah, there's a few hacks and bodges on there but it's basically very well laid out and it's very typical of the era and my hats off to whoever laid out this board because I can't see a single jumper link anywhere on this board and that is always the holy grail of any PCB layout engineer is to basically get zero jumper links so you have only got a double sided board like this it's not like they've given you the luxury of four layers and you can have a big ground and power plane and everything else no you've only got two layers and they've basically laid it all out in very traditional style uh, for a double sided layout like this in nice rows like that all the chips sort of line up in beautiful uh, columns like that and they've arranged it so that there's zero jumper links there might be I don't well I can't see one I, I will stand to be corrected on that but that is it, it's just beautiful thing of beauty joy forever and the actual circuit design very typical of the era of course it's not like a uh, Sinclair which tried to reduce it all in gate arrays down to a couple of chips and things like that they were uh, in the future in the 80s but back then basically you've got the Z80 processor here you've got your RAM and you've got your ROM and everything else is basically just standard 74 uh, series what is it LS yeah 74 LS series logic pretty much everywhere else there looks to be one particular device which is not standard and that's uh, the only one which is socketed by the way so we'll have to have a good look at that one and curiously these are obviously the uh, ROMs here and they've taken that's what that board on the back there is so they've taken this ribbon cable with this uh, dip header here off to that board on the back 
that's the level two ROM upgrade because you, if you bought a level one, they would actually uh, upgrade it for free, I believe. If you send it back to uh, Radio Shack, they would uh, do the hardware upgrade to upgrade it to level three. That's why when we flip it over, we'll see a few bodge wires on the back. Room enough in those two sockets, so they needed the uh, expansion board on the back. And there you have it, a couple of uh, bodge jumper wires going from various points over here over to the board with uh, three ROM chips on here. Let's take a closer look at those. And by the way, just looking at the routing on this back of the board they've done a really good job as an experienced PCB guy who's done many of these countless uh, double-sided layout boards like this you can tell they've got this pretty much right and optimal trust me it's not easy laying out a double-sided board like this and well they've done really well manufactured by NEC here these are uh, mask ROMs and you can tell it's a ROM set because they're basically got this uh, part number you've never heard of and then A, B and C there so yeah it's a three-part ROM set and of course it needs uh, three ROMs here to make up the 12k ROM so these would be uh, 4k each 4, 8, 12 beautiful well there's the money shot look at that mostec z80 cpu none of this z80a rubbish run at four megahertz oh no sirree oh, 1.774 thank you very much is that a date code in there look 7905 so this maybe this isn't a 1978 unit but a very early week 19 uh 79 because uh, they you know these things wouldn't have been sitting around in stock right these would have gone straight out so this thing probably only was manufactured this machine like maybe a couple of weeks after this chip was made would be my guess so if we look at some of the other date codes here yeah like late nine you know 38th week 78 51st week 78 this one very early 79 as well so it looks like yeah the first you know dozen weeks of 1979 this was manufactured and likewise for the ram as well there it is classic tms 4116 yeah the six weeks 79 in that classic ceramic package oh i love it they're vintage stuff and these are one of the early uh, dynamic memories they're not sram which was uh typical of the very early uh computers so that's why you could afford 16k back then in uh, dram and the dash 30 there that indicates 300 nanoseconds access time oh, slow as a wet week and check out the pins on this z80 here look at that they've gone all uh or tarnished have they or is some some of the plastic sort of leached out i don't know what's going on there Ugh. and that motorola chip as i said is the only other oddball one out that's not standard uh, 7400 series logic here so it's um an a motorola 8046670 bit of a google on that turns out that's the character generator chip and it was the same one apparently still used in the model 3 so yeah, that'd be some sort of uh, gate array holding the uh, various characters for presumably only the uppercase stuff. And we've got ourselves the main regulator there on its own little uh, low profile heat sink. It's probably good enough. Didn't hear any uh, uh, complaints about this thing overheating, but I stand to be corrected. Anyway, it's the 2N6594 uh, PMP uh, part in a standard TO3 package and well that was a common way to mount uh, still is a common way to mount uh, TO3 packages onto a PCB like that so no problems whatsoever I don't like this uh, freestanding tip 29B just hanging its ass out over the edge there jeez well I guess if you're not living life on the edge you're taking up too much room We've got a couple of big ass electros happening there. Look at that, 10,000 mic, thank you very much, along with a 2200 mic, 35 volt one. Crikey. But hey, this thing would suck a lot of juice though. I mean, these uh, dynamic rams here take half a watt a pop. And there's a couple of crusty old pots there to uh, tweak your cassette interface. Make sure you have your tongue at the right angle. And there's the main crystal, 10.6445 megahertz. So that was divided by six to get your uh, main processor clock, which is precisely 1.774083 repeater. There you go. It was slightly above. This sucker was overclocked from its nominal 1.774 meg. Beauty.
Well, it's no wonder this thing didn't meet any SEC requirements and basically they had to uh, stop selling it, replace it with the Model 3 because of that. They couldn't get it uh, certified. I mean, you know, you've got no uh, ground plane in this thing to take care of anything. Probably the power layout is, uh, you know, it's pretty standard for the day, but maybe they didn't have enough uh, decoupling on it. But look, you know, when you start adding memory interfaces, big parallel buses running like this, I mean, gah, you're just asking for it. And your expansion interface basically just, uh, once again, you've got long, you know, long unshielded ribbon cable just going off willy nilly to your expansion box. You can't have that. And there's no uh, metalized uh, shielding inside the case or anything like that. Is nothing. Hey, somebody signed that, have they? There you go. Love it. But uh, yeah, no, none of that. So. No good whatsoever. I don't see any uh, chokes or anything else on any of the I.O. lines. Nah, it's just not happening. And for those who are keen, here is the back of the monitor. There you go. Manufactured 1978. Oh, how crusty this thing is. Unbelievable. And for those who absolutely must see the crust for themselves. Oh, hey, look at this. Ah, oh, <laughs> beautiful. Look at that. Oh yeah, that's got uh, 1970s RCA written all over it. You betcha. And that is the model KTR124SA. Oh yeah, look at some of that. Some tag board action going on down in there. With that resistor with a lead wrapped over it. <laughs> holding it in place. Oh man. Woohoo! This is fantastic stuff. Sorry about the uh, handheld work here. Oh yeah. But hey, I guess we shouldn't knock it. It is still working after 37 years. So, well, you can't complain. And apparently, no, it hasn't been uh, repaired. This is factory original. Okay, let's have a quick look at this on a spectrum analyzer. I'm going to use the uh, Tech MDO 3000 here. So I've got nothing connected on the input. I've got 0 to 10 megahertz uh, span here and uh, a resolution uh, filter of uh, 300 hertz. And that is our baseline. There it is, basically all below uh, minus 105 dBm. So there you go. There's nothing at all. And if I now plug in my antenna, it'll take some time because of the uh, narrow band filter there but look at that ta-da there we go there is our second harmonic right there 1.774 megahertz times two roughly 3.56 megahertz by the way as far as the antenna goes on here i've just got one of these whip antennas i could probably uh move it down like that or do something whoa there we go our noise floor just uh jumped up fairly drastically let's keep it like that actually <laughs> By the way, this thing's really slow to move these cursors. It's a dog when you've got the uh, filter set such uh, so low. It's got to muck around and do a lot of processing, and it just basically just uh, locks up the uh, front panel control there. Really slow. Anyway, there is the fundamental 1.76 megahertz. There's the second harmonic, and so on. And I've changed the resolution bandwidth to 10 kilohertz there, and you can see how it's just much more responsive on the cursor now or oh, a little bit of a jaggy in there but basically work in real time so yeah it doesn't like to be doing any heavy background processing there and you can see all this crap down at the low end here i mean it's just or like you know sub one megahertz and uh stuff like that it's just garbage and that's why the am broadcast band is just being swamped and there's from 0 to 2 megahertz with 100 megahertz uh, resolution bandwidth filter. And you can't even call up the bloody menus when this thing is just chewing all that, doing all that processing at that very narrow band filter right down at the bottom. Ah, oh, it's just painful. It's practically locked up. Really, I mean, I, oh, no, it just did something then sporadically. Unbelievable. And just because we can, let's compare the Spectrum with the Trash 80 Model 100. Uh, Rumoured to be the last machine that Bill Gates ever actually wrote code for. So I'll run a little uh, program here just to loop it through and we'll see what we get on the Spectrum. So there we go, I've got the antenna directly over the thing. 
um, you know, this is just mucking around really, so uh, no people complaining about that I'm not doing it right, just mucking around, but look at that, pretty clean compared to the uh, Model 1, that's for sure, especially down at the low end here, there's not much happening there at all, we're from 0 to 2 megahertz again with a 300, mega, uh, 300 hertz uh, resolution filter. And that there is actually running a program. That's just running a Hello World program. It's just printing Hello World again and again. So relatively clean compared to the Model 1. And if I expand that out from 0 to 10 megahertz, there we go. We can see the main processor clock there, 2.4 megahertz. This is an 80C85, so it actually runs faster than the uh, Trash 80 Model 1. So there you go, that's the uh, clock frequency, then the uh, second harmonic, and so on. And watch this, if I uh, switch the Model 1 on, here we go. So we've got our baseline of our uh, 102 here. So switch that on, and... Bingo, look at that jump up very, very significantly. Huge jump there. I mean, that's jumping up a good 10, maybe 15 dB there, because we're 10 dBm per division. So it's not really surprising, as we've seen in the teardown, and uh, by the way, I'll link in the teardown for the uh, Tandy Model uh, 100 102 here, which I've done uh, back as well. It's not surprising that the Model 1 here is a much noisier, a much bigger emitter than the 100 series here. This sucker, not only did it have, you know, huge bus lines running everywhere, but we're talking about uh, not the huge current consumption in just the DRAMs, for example. As I said, those DRAMs will take like uh, half a watt a chip or something like that. That means huge big current spikes in there and when you uh, include large current spikes with big loop areas inside there and like power loop areas then well you know it's just going to emit pretty horribly. Whereas something like the uh, Model 100 here, really low power one using SRAM, we've got much lower uh, current spikes on the uh, transitions and things like that. So really you know no surprise whatsoever. And yep, I'm still trying to get over how awfully dog slow this thing is on those low resolution bandwidth uh, settings. It's just it's practically almost unusable. Unbelievable. I don't know what the hell they're doing in the processing architecture of this thing, but oh, they really need to fix it. I know you actually get the Spectrum Analyzer plug-in for free on this thing now, which is, yeah, great, but geez, at least get that working. Unbelievable. Oh. So there you go. I hope you found that retro teardown as interesting as I did. The Trash 80 Model 1. Ah, oh, does it get any more classic than that? Unbelievable. Let's break our little program there. And CLS and list. Ah, oh, it's just uh, too good. Oh, by the way, I didn't show you the uh, power adapter. There we go. It's just a big Trash 80 power adapter. Um, a big linear uh, transformer by the weight of the damn thing. And there you go. I had fun looking at this, and I can't believe it still works after 37 years or whatever it is. Close enough to that. Unbelievable. Still works like the day it was bought out of the box. Fantastic. How many other computers can still claim that? Terrific. Anyway, if you want to see the uh, high-resolution teardown photos of this, I usually take high-res photos there on eevblog.com. That'll be linked in down below. And as always, if you like Teardown Tuesday, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.